Hello. I wanted to cover a little macro template kind of thing with um, JavaScript, specifically using Node.js on the back end. One of the things I like a lot with uh, PHP was the just the way you could sort of just interleave PHP code throughout an HTML document and going over to the Node.js world that's something that I miss a lot it's sort of a different paradigm a little bit I would say a lower level paradigm less like high level features like that built right in but anyway um, PHP is pretty bloated even if you go and like really fine-tune it which takes a fair amount of extra work and then it runs on top of something like Apache usually and there's a little bit of bloat there I mean for the amount of features and everything that those things offer you know that wasn't for the past you know for the 20 years that those reign supreme or whatever that was pretty cool and I was always a lamp stack guy even once Node.js started taking off I was like ah I'm just I'm not buying it I'm sticking with you know I feel like I can tune the lamp stack down to what I want and everything and get reasonable performance and that was right when virtual private servers were getting really big so for five dollars five US dollars you could get you know you could run a site or three of whatever even with like frameworks like WordPress and stuff maybe even Drupal you could run like multiple sites on a five dollar server maybe a ten dollar server so that was really all I needed to squeeze out of a server for my clients anyway and I could even put more servers you know more services on each server because a lot of their sites weren't even seeing that much traffic so I could get away with like 10 sites on a server if I really wanted to and then just extract any sites that gained any popularity or whatever but um, that being said, so Node.js is very slim, very quick. I I really appreciate it now, and I don't know. I've just done that, so it's like, how do you, how can you achieve that template type of thing in the simplest way? I'm not into frameworks. Like even when I talk about PHP, I'm not even really talking about like smarty templates per se. I'm talking about just you know that natural sort of templated nature where all the .php files which are really oftentimes like an h it's sort of like just a glorified dynamic html type of thing where all the stuff's pre-processed on the server right before it's sent out to the remote client to the web browser and it's sort of like a search and replace or like a process and replace type of thing so anyway i use my terms loosely um and I hope that fills in enough context. But what I'm going for here is uh, the most simple, organic approach. No third-party libraries. I avoid third-party libraries like a plague. They are, they're just ridiculous, nine times out of ten, in my opinion. There's some room for some libraries sometimes, but I usually prefer to write my own. I would say the majority of the time I'll write my own, and I just keep it really slim. I'm not scared of it because... The, the trade-offs, the amount of time you take to learn a framework, to deal with the bugs in that framework, and even not to deal with the bugs in that framework, they become somebody else's problem to a certain degree, but if that somebody else doesn't fix that problem, then they become your problem, and then you're that much more disconnected from the source code and everything. So I just, there's a trade-off with everything, and most times with third-party frameworks, I just... I don't see that it's just not worth it and why not take I come from last century of the C programming thing and like building up little libraries for yourself and occasionally you know definitely using libraries from other people especially like the Allegro video game programming library that was a really big deal to me back in the day but um, a lot of programmers that come from that era have maybe a better balance and knowledge of you build up your own little things that's what's about that's what a library was about was like you build up your own little utility library things and you just sort of like use those in your new projects as you see fit so I like that approach and 
so right here anyway I'll just cut to the chase and it's like so there's three major options of how I could do this really simplistic templating kind of thing and I hope I don't offend anybody with the way I'm using that word but instead of whatever you know I think everybody uses all terminologies wrong so or not everybody using all terminologies wrong but most people use most terminologies wrong most or much of the time so I'm over it anyway the first option which I thought of was like I avoid ES6 features that's another thing I I like the beauty of JavaScript the closer you go back to the very beginning of it back in the 90s and it was a very pure object oriented system and catered to a very pure object oriented paradigm um, that being said there it was rushed to market in the mid 90s JavaScript was rushed to market so it was kind of lacking and you did have to build up a lot of boilerplate and there was a lot of gray areas and stuff like that but I feel by ES3 I always say ES3 was enough for me because by ES3 I feel like it was just such a mature language and literally like 99.99% .99 of the time I get away with just using ES3 and I even think you know having the keyword function instead of arrow functions and stuff like that I prefer that I think arrow functions are mostly ridiculous I realize that you know the lexical scoping and some stuff like that with them can help some people especially beginners but um, it just adds to the confusion of the mess there there's definitely a little bit of a confusing mess in JavaScript and that's just one example arrow functions are a good thing to just the way they look they look like a sort of like a logical operator they don't ring to me as a function instantly and I sort of if I read the word function it sort of reads better in my opinion and JavaScript is supposed to be functionally scoped I feel like it's a function first very pure object oriented language and that to me is what JavaScript's about um, or function centric maybe I should say people confuse that with functional and they think oh it's a functional programming language and it's not I mean there have been a lot of things added and if everybody you know implemented the full ECMAScript standard then yeah maybe it would be pretty close to functional but functional is not necessarily ideal there's a lot of like principles I think we can borrow from function the functional paradigm and apply them to JavaScript but actually using a functional structure in JavaScript especially a strict very pure functional structure is just that's honestly I feel like that's ridiculous I'm not saying I know everything or whatever and I'd love somebody to show me otherwise but I just I'd rather just borrow you know like dependency injection ideas like that and just stick with the functional function centric and primarily purely object oriented paradigm the object oriented paradigm has never really been tapped into like it should I'm not really gonna do any of that stuff right now so I should just shut up because I'm just preaching at this point so this is back to templating in Node.js, which of course uses JavaScript. So the thing I was saying about the ES6 stuff, uh, maybe it's even, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's ES6 when they added a lot of the browsers and Node had added it and like Node added it in 4. I think Mozilla web browsers had added the, uh, the back quote template strings or template literals, they're now called, I believe. They had added it by like Firefox 32. So it basically goes back to around 2015 since then all the stuff that came out that year and beyond supports this uh, this back quote string and of course I despise it I think it's stupid too little too late um, for the most part with the language so I don't use it I use single quotes I lean towards using single quotes in JavaScript it's a scripting language that's another key paradigm feature about it that I keep in mind at all times and in scripting languages it's more ideal to lean towards a single quote a lightweight quote um, and then I use heavyweight double quotes in my HTML and just stick to that whole thing and it it works out nicely for me and if I want to add a uh, you know an expression I just use the plus operator against the quote and that works for me and I found it I 
honestly, I personally find that readable. I find it a little bit more readable, even maybe just because I'm more used to it than some of the stuff you can do with this back quote and the uh, these sort of expression macro things that you can put in there like that. I've looked at some examples on like the Mozilla Developer Network, MDN's website, and there was some stuff I saw where they were trying to kind of show like some extreme nested examples and everything. And I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And I had, had to actually look at like the, the ES3, ES5 or whatever it was considered. I think it was just plain old ES3 of the style that I like. And I built up from there and then walked myself into this newer stuff. And I felt like, well, you know what? That's kind of weird that I find the old way more readable to understand the new way. Like, and plus I can go back, I can write something and literally support the last 20 years of browsers nearly I mean starting with Firefox 1.0 basically and beyond if I'm writing to ES3 of course there's changes in the DOM and stuff like that over the years but that's my point is like if I write with ES3 I don't have to worry anything about backwards compatibility and it's just now to the point with ES6 where people can stop doing polyfills and you know, back compiling to ES5 and stuff, and that just, that is so bizarre to me that people were writing websites like that because it's like, JavaScript's already so sticky and nasty in the web browser as far as being the single thread that just hogs everything, that it's like, get in and get out, you know, like, you don't want to, just the idea of, like, compiling back to, like, chunky ES5 and stuff, and... <laughs> writing classes in JavaScript like I don't know I guess I there's no way around me preaching so what I would do with this template idea with these template literals is the idea is you can since I don't use them very much I can use them within my HTML documents I can just drop those tags in like so it's just a regular HTML5 style HTML document as you can see right here, I've put a back quote, the very first character to start it. And I know you might be thinking, wait, isn't doc type supposed to be the very first thing that the uh, the web browser hits? And it will be because this is all on the back end, remember? So this will be parsed out and that will basically have the, uh, the little mini template engine treat this all like one big string, one of those template strings. So we come down here, there's some CSS I put in the head. This is just a sample little web page that I've been using lately for dinking around with some stuff. And then we come in here and you can see right there, I just inject that, just put that right in, just literally like that. And right here I have one as an example of how to escape one so that it's not processed by just putting this backslash right in front of the dollar sign there. And then down here I have a third one. And you know, I didn't do this all at once. I like stepped through and did one little change at a time, tested it and kind of kicked it around a little bit and then went in and added more and dealt with all the zillions of bugs that I created. So don't feel overwhelmed. I'm just, I figured it would be better to just, especially with obviously with all the preaching I'm injecting into it, to just, uh, you know, give you an overview of more of the final prototype of it. And right here I just have another script tag with... Um, you know, a function to fade in a button. Well, I guess that's irrelevant to what we're talking about here. Down here is where I mean to go. That just, once somebody starts typing in that text box, it fades in like a submit button. It's no big deal, just like a little polishy thing. So down here, we have, I'm bringing in a source file, file.js. And if we come over here, we can see it's also, I after I got it working with HTML, I thought, hey, maybe it could have a use with JS files too, and you know, maybe CSS and all that kind of stuff. So I thought, well, I'll test it with a JS file because that's where things are most likely to get hairy, I'd imagine. So I did that, and as you can see here, what I'm doing too is I'm closing it with another back quote. So the very first thing is that back quote no additional new lines or anything usually unless you prefer that and then the very very last thing is a back quote um, what that does this is the node.js code here and what it is is this is a basic web server like an HTTP server from scratch 
so that's this whole thing right here acts as a web server so don't be overwhelmed this isn't the uh, the templating code the template code is actually literally just within there right there that's the template code and these variables don't even have to these are just the variables that were in there if you remember I had like a label if we go back over here scroll up a little bit and you can see label I actually escaped it out but if I hadn't then it, that would provide a value for that and there's something and what I did was just take the word and give it a capitalize it and just you know keep it consistent like that so function name becomes literally function name did some stuff like that so it's not overly exciting right here for placeholder this is in file 2 and I just did a console log and I did the placeholder right there so that will replace that with this sentence replaces placeholder and what I did here is I used these literal uh, escape for the literal single quotes and I thought about it you know because it's a console log statement obviously I need to uh, add the quotes there if I wanted to I could even I haven't tested it but I would assume I could just add single quotes right around this and not even uh, supply the single quotes over here I wouldn't then I wouldn't have to do this escaping thing I could just supply this uh, you know just like I'm doing up here with everything just a textual search and replace but I went ahead and just did it like this for now and instead of doing double quotes for one thing that violates my idea of liking to keep JavaScript single quotes if possible and the back quotes of course I don't like them I only use them for what I'm showing you right now and uh, so I figured well I'll just use the single quote and I'll do this escape in front of it which is necessary to embed it and that will make that will kind of highlight the fact that this is a, a string that's going to replace a string and you know just make that that much more obvious so that was my reasoning behind that you know no big deal if somebody else wants to do it a different way of course so anyway I'll just quickly try to walk through this so just to give you an idea of the HTTP server thing don't worry about understanding every little thing about this but I'll just kind of just put it in quick perspective so that it's not completely foreign um, it's importing these Node.js modules so it's you know and of course it's using the old style imports I don't like ES6 plus imports and it you know why when this works fine it's like I don't know whatever I'm sure there's reasons so it's just an unencrypted version and it needs to pull from the local file system obviously it needs to feed HTML files JavaScript files images whatever and then right here is to uh, what I plan to do is maybe if I don't need up too much time is to go ahead and refactor this out to a module its own little module so that you know just to get a little more familiar with it and take care of that step I had originally started writing it from its own module which is kind of against my principles of build a monolith first and then as that monolith turns into a beast then cut away the complexity and extract it from there as needed um, and I started having problems and I was debugging and I was like you know what I'm just gonna paste this code right back in here and it was really only a few lines but as now you can see it's getting kind of beasty it still fits this section of code still fit, fits on a single screen you know I have my screen if you look over here I ha it uh, you know it's within the 24 line limit within 80 characters. Well, I'm exactly at 80 characters right there. So I try and stick to that old school screen limit. It seems to work pretty well. So this is kind of filling. It's kind of filled up that that screen full of text thing, which says, "Hey, this definitely should be extracted." If it's more than a few lines, realistically, it's question for extract it out to a function or its own module or object whatever you want to call it so anyway so maybe we'll deal with that then right here it's just um, this is actually creating the HTTP server and I made a couple comments earlier this right here is just some clevery kinda short code to deal with a query string you know in a HTML document there's the post method where it sends data in the background ideally through like HTTPS and then it's sort of hidden and encrypted and a lot more secure but then there's also query strings where it sends the data as parameters like key value pairs in tacked onto the end of the URL address 
and that has benefits too because you can bookmark it you can use it as a really simple API different things like that so there's different reasons and I figured hey if I can add that to my web server in a line or two why wouldn't I you know so I went ahead and added that to where it's just basically coming in here and uh, checks it's hard coded to check a public HTML subdirectory for the files and then it just goes in and extracts the path that's before that so that you know that would screw up the file system reading if it had that query string attached to it and then down here this is just to uh, test whether or not that paths a directory so if you don't give a file name whether or not it's a directory and whether or not it's an existing directory and you have access to it and all that kind of stuff and if it isn't it will send out a 404 and if it is it will check and see you know it will check the very last character of that path and if it's not a backslash or a forward slash which turns out to be a really big deal um, if you don't have that forward slash it at least with Node.js it will read the directory as a directory and everything properly and it will even pull like an index file out of it but the browsers will not know that they're in that directory because all that's happening on the back end like the you know the forward slash is implicitly inserted and all that so when the browser asks for the assets for the page like the images and maybe even relative files like javascript css files it's going to go to the one directory lower to the root directory so that's an important thing to keep in mind there and so what i do is i say you know if that's not added when they typed in the URL, the uh, the address, then go ahead and uh, change the location to be the location minus this public HTML, which they don't know about, and uh, then tack that onto the very end of that, and then re respond with a permanent redirect, and then return bounces all the way out. This is Node.js, so it's async, so it's good to, I mean, it is in general, but in here we need to make sure and get out otherwise the code's just gonna run on and then so otherwise you know if the path and the URL and all that's good then we're gonna come down here and we're gonna uh, looks like if the last character is just a trailing thing trailing slash then go ahead and add index to it and of course if this was want to be a more robust server this could turn into a lot more functionality there where it could add like PHP or HTM without the HTML or whatever okay and that gets us to the part where our templater could kick in because normally what I would do here is I would just read the file not do any templating so it basically be like it would do this read the file thing um, this is called the error first and the uh, callback last pattern I think they just call it the error first callback pattern for async programming it's not my favorite, but it's sort of my middle of the road favorite. I don't like promises. I don't even think I still completely understand promises, but for the most part I do. I get the gist of them and I see the code and it's ugly. It's completely, it's horrid. I, I don't like it. I don't think that's the way to go. Um, to keep it simple and with this example, I'm sticking to the sort of old norm with it, but I've actually invented another pattern that I'd like to share I just haven't taken the time to kind of refine it but I I was able to invent it because I was so disgusted when I went in to learn promises to uh, deal with this node.js stuff that I was like alright there's got to be a better way and check it out it works all the way back with ES3 of course so there's that bonus um, so what we're doing here is I like to try and keep my stuff readable it's a prefix path because it has that public HTML added to it of course the, the word function instead of the arrow operator is my the way I roll and then um, the error first is going to be keeping it readable bad file name um, I didn't pit oh actually I have a couple different versions of this server I usually pit bad file I haven't gone back and updated this one I'll sort of like kick it around in a different folder and everything that's sort of like my uh, like you could think of it I need to start using git branch more and do it like that and then just merge it back in but I still just use git on a, as minimal basis as I too minimal probably for using that tool just mainly for commits I just do a commit down a single tree I don't branch very often at all but I need to so anyway this should probably be bad file 
because uh, I'm tempted to just change it right now while I'm here. But technically, in the real flow of things, you should do one change at a time. So if I was to change that, I should change that alone in isolation and commit it as that, test it, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'll just leave it for now. But bat file is a little more descriptive or a little more general because it might be a correct file name, but we might just not have permission to read that file. So bat file kind of leaves that open for that idea. And then uh, file content is actually what it's going to return and it will return that as a, a buffer an array buffer so it's going to be like i think 8-bit type of integers and stuff like that but that's okay to pass to a response a response is sort of um, polymorphic in that sense where it can take a string or you know that array buffer type of thing so if it is a bad file it's going to just respond with 404 and responds this little function i have in here which just takes an HTTP status and possibly file contents. Of course, on the 404s, I'm just leaving file content undefined because, you know, it's not really necessary. Could do a fancy 404 page, but I'm just doing a... Just let the browser give you its 404 error. And then it just does that, and it respond ends, and with the 404, that will just be undefined. It will basically be like passing nothing there. And this function is a nested function in here as you can see it's nested within this HTTP server deal and the reason I'm doing that is that's one of the benefits of JavaScript like going back to the ES3 and even before style is that I'm pretty sure you can nest functions before ES3 but anyway um, that function automatically gets this scope around it right here so by doing that I get this HTTP response I don't have to pass it as a third parameter and have like this external function. And it shows me that this function kind of works just within this context more or less, you know, so, or I shouldn't say more or less, that's specifically how it works. And anyway, there's a lot of benefits to that. Of course, if I scaled out the code, maybe I would have to send the function out or do something like that. But for now this works, it keeps it compact. It's all within itself and I don't have to, I can just, keep dealing with that response it's less code it's simpler and it's nice and javascripty so where was i with this stuff now so anyway that's what that's going to do it's going to come down here and that's why you see respond and then if it's not a bad file name this is just a typical pattern for dealing with these uh the callback functions you have to check for the error condition and whatever which I don't really like and that's why my pattern that I've created that is instead of the error first callback or the promise patterns it's different it kind of like helps smooth that stuff out and not deal with it or deal with it but in a cleaner way principally speaking so otherwise if everything's cool and the file is the prefix path the very tail end of the prefix path the last five characters our .html, then we know we're dealing with an HTML file and we want to process it. Or, if the prefix path, the last three characters are .js, then it's a JavaScript file, and of course we want to deal with that. That could also, we could add .css and whatever else in here. The reason I have to check the, the file path name is because there's also image files that you know the browser will sort of secretly request in the background that are embedded in your HTML you know you have like whatever image and it's gonna go ahead and ask the server for those I'd spaced that when I started creating this code and I kept it kept trying to access a GIF file and I wasn't realizing I'm like why is the second time because I was testing my query strings too so I type a little bit in the box hit submit and um, the second time I get back garbage and I was like what is going on you know and then finally I realized oh man it's asking for the image file on that page and I'm not you know handling that so anyway that's something to watch out for what I want to mention too while I'm right here is this or operator being trailing on the line instead of at the beginning of the line in scripting languages that's the way you're supposed to do it um, especially in JavaScript because if you don't do that the automatic semicolon insertion might kick in and then you could end up with bugs that are just like what's going on so in javascript whenever you continue a line most times almost always you want to uh make sure and leave a trailing operator there so that it knows hey trailing operator look on the next line for something 
of course it is more readable to pit it in my opinion and a lot of people's opinion to pit it at the beginning of the line but that's for those fancy compiled languages and javascript you know a lot of implementations do compile javascript but it's not in the really general loose old school sense it's not what we call a compiled language we call it you know or a static language maybe i don't know that's where all the terms are just like it's hard to say it exactly the way it should be said but it's a scripting language and that's the way that's the uh the best practice or the appropriate practice and right here are just the variables that are the search and replace sort of variables they could be expressions um that type of a thing even in the document itself you know even like in this static html document this doesn't even have to be a variable name that could be literally javascript code so right let's just go like right under this one i guess and do something that's like javascript code like one plus one and i'll even make it like that see if that introduces any bugs into our stuff okay so it can be anything it can be expressions whatever something plus one you know like we could do something else plus one maybe stuff like that and uh that's the way that's one of the benefits of this so it's a lot like the php thing but anyway, for the most part, what I did was I just did these variables. And these variables could come from a file, could do a, open a file and do a, you know, for each line in the file, have a variable and come in here and substitute them. And I think even cleaner a method would be to uh, do that on an object. Like, because of the namespace issues and stuff, like, I think the cleanest way to, I didn't do it in this example, but would be to come in here and make everything like obj dot something. Or whatever you know or like vegan a's that's my handle like i could do vegan a's dot something on every little thing and then create a vegan a's object and then they would all pull their values off of that object and that would sort of keep everything tightly scoped as far as the namespace so <clears throat> excuse me i think that would be maybe the most ideal and that's more in the pure object oriented sense so anyway what i've done of course is just load the variables up so they're all there if you forget one it's it will give you an error when you run this and it will say hey you know uh, function name not defined or whichever one you forgot whichever the first one you forgot was so you can just go back and sort of look quick trial and error on that so right here is where the stuff really happens it's a uh, file content to string because of course it's that array buffer or that buffer array I forget which way I guess buffer arrays are more correct way to say it um, to string explicitly makes it a string and so that's going to return us i don't want to say it too much i'll i'll get <laughs> confused figure out exactly what state of return that should return the whole thing wrapped in like plain quotes so to speak i've done a console log on that before maybe i should do that again Content. And then what it does, so I'm just overriding file content. In my opinion, that's a good pattern in JavaScript is they're dynamic variables. So feel free to just override them instead of creating a zillion different variables. You know, just have one that's pretty general. You know, file content, no matter what state, whether it's in a string format or buffered array format type of thing, it's like it's still the file content. And then we come down here, log it, a little debugging kind of thing. And then, um, so right here, this is something that I did. At first, I didn't even have this. My first, you know, trial was go ahead and put the closing quote on there because that only makes sense, right? You pull in, what I'm doing to get to the point is I'm going to eval this string. And that's going to, you know, you pull it in as like an, a string that's wrapping this string, like a normal old school string wrapping this string. And then you eval that string, and that effectually, effectively drops those quotes, and you the result is this more modern template literal string. And then when you process that, you know JavaScript will automatically process that, and then it right then it will kick in, and it will uh, 
replace, it will do the, you know, the template, what they call the template literals, I guess. Uh, it will replace those, like, macro expressions. So I figured, you know, just first thought was, like, the most simple implementation would just be to do this. Don't worry about, like, testing for whether or not there's a final quote or not. And uh, rolling with it like that. Of course, you can't have, like, embedded... Well, I mean, you could do embedded stuff, but there's all sorts of problems that could crop up with that. But anyway, I did this, and that was like a really simple implementation because I knew what to expect. I wasn't doing any nested stuff. And then I thought, you know what would be cool? Just like with PHP, a lot of times if you do like a pure PHP file, you open it first thing with a PHP tag, and then you don't close it, right? And there's reasons for that to do with like the spacing at the end and stuff. And I thought, well, that would be kind of cool, you know, to do that and be even more like PHP and offer that functionality. And then as I started thinking things out and running some tests and stuff, I realized like, hey, that might not just be cool because less is more a lot of times, but it would also be uh, something that makes sense because what if I did have, you know, what if for some reason I had like, oops, wrong kind, like if I did that and I just for some reason wanted a back quote there, you know, like maybe this is like uh what do you call it, markdown, and I had some back quotes in there, so it's like, oh man, well, then I would have to do a thing where I, like, counted back quotes, and made sure that I'm grabbing the very last back quote out of the whole file, you know, stuff like that, and then I thought, well, what if they omit the back quote, you know, then I kind of lose that ability, to, the ability to omit the back quote, because then what if, you know, there's just this single, there's a single back quote there and none there. Then it's like, oh, that's the last back quote in the file, so it might stop processing there, you know, or whatever, or do something to screw it up. So I'm like, oh, man. So that's the things like that I started thinking about. I thought, you know what, it makes more sense to just expect the end of, you know, you have to do it from the beginning, or you don't have to, but... For me personally, I haven't found a reason yet not to. Of course, I'm sure people could think of a hundred reasons not to. But anyway, so that's uh, that was my first idea. And then I, you know, like I said, I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to leave it off? So right here in this example, one of the main reasons I even created this little file was to just bring in this uh, conditional for if the uh, first the first character is a back quote and the last character is a back quote, oh, excuse me, not a back quote, then go ahead and add that back quote, go ahead and append one. And the important thing too is this brings up another feature right here is that if the first character is a back quote, so you now have the option if that first character isn't a back quote, then it will just pass it through, like as if it's just, you know, it won't try and process it and do any replacements or you don't end up having to deal with any of that logic. It's just a quick eject on that so this works and then we come down here and here's the main thing where we take that two string file which has a back quote appended to the end if it wasn't there and then it evaluates that and that in turn will return a back quote template literal string it will basically return um, it will return this effectively you know what I mean? And, but as JavaScript code, not just as a string anymore, it will now flip that effectively into a JavaScript expression. It will return that expression because just like if you leave a string literal just hanging there, then that string literal is sort of like its own expression. Kind of like the use strict thing, or in Python, the way you do a documentation comment and function if that makes any sense. It's like there's a string there, it's evaluated, but it doesn't really change state on its own. It's just sort of like an ephemeral expression. But what we do is we real quick grab that and we do change state with it. We apply that to the file content variable. So now file content gets overwritten with itself, but now that, you know, that's effectively the same thing as saying, you know, uh, 
that whole HTML file is going to be there instead of that. It's going to be like that, you know, and even if you really like that. And any of this stuff is going to replace with other stuff, you know, other stuff. So, one and that, but what it will leave here. I believe it will just leave, you know, that kind of a thing there, and that's what it will return, and then once this gets assigned to this, that's when this processing, I believe, should happen to actually replace those, and if you find out otherwise, let me know, please. So. That's effectively what's going on there. And then regardless of whether or not it actually ended up processing it because it's an HTML or a JS file, regardless of that, it's going to respond with this uh, 200, which means OK, document found, and the file content. And the file content, if it did process it, will be a string. And if it didn't, it will probably be like a buffered array and that will come down to this respawn thing and it will go in here and then of course it will pass that to response end after setting this status right there so that's what's going on probably a little bit more longer I'm gonna go through this one more time real quick if there's just a plain black backslash add index that's part of the web server so we know that now we'll get down into here and we'll say it's going to read the file that it's determined that it needs to read off the server. If it's bad, send a 404. If it's not, um, and it's an HTML file or it's a JavaScript file, then come in here and see if it needs some processing. I've hard coded these. Of course, this could be supplemented with any other code, a function call out to pull from a file or whatever, you know, values. You could just think of this as any logic you want goes here that would set the values that might be in, you know, it could be crazy complex logic, preferably hidden behind a function, maybe in some module or something, but this is just a very simple example. This right here is gonna get that file content, convert it from that buffered array to a string, and then we're gonna log that. Um, and then down here, it's gonna say, hey, if that first character is the, the back quote, then and the uh, very last character is not a back quote, then go ahead and append one. Maybe I haven't set it up to not parse it. I think it's going to try and do an eval no matter what. Well, that's one thing we'll test. Okay, so anyway, in my this is a programmer's notepad too. I can just go to tools. I've added Node.js. And then I always use like an incognito window to test my stuff. And I always close out because this incognito window effectively becomes like its own session if you don't uh, if you don't close it. You notice like if you go to like some social media site or whatever, you can like go in, do your thing, leave, go to another site, and then, you know, open another tab and go back to that social media site and you'll still be logged in or whatever. So... One of the things with an incognito session to keep in mind is it's really sort of like it goes to the default profile a lot of times. It will pull in that info and a lot of it, you know, more than it should. And then it will, um, in my opinion, and then it will sort of just act like its own copy of that profile for the most part. And it won't, of course, I don't know. It's sort of half incognito in reality of what I think. I think it should just be a basically like pretending that you just installed the web browser first time you opened it and you know if you close to if you open a new incognito window that's the other weird thing if you open a second incognito window you're not going to go incognito anymore you'll still keep those cookies and stuff from that first window session which that that right there seems like the minimal thing to me like if it's a new window come on you know but anyway so make sure after if you're testing in a browser and you're not used to that kind of stuff you need to uh, use incognito and close it out because like that permanent redirect thing that I did if when I was debugging that that's where I was kind of like uh, I don't need to go that far uh, but once you set that permanent redirect in a non incognito window it's like that's there until you like completely clear out the browser you know so 
I didn't want to like completely clear out all my cookies and stuff for my other sites I visit. So anyway, that's that. So what we can see here is this stuff's working. We can type something in the box and hit enter and then it adds the query string up here. So that was some stuff I'd done for the general web server itself before I cared about templating. And I figured, well, I'll just go ahead and like continue with that work because, you know, it seemed like a good idea to make sure it all works. So if we come jump back over here, we can see, uh, like I did, I escaped that label. So when we come over here, we can see that label still just the raw uh, macro expression. But these other ones were it went ahead and did that and there you can see that one plus one did evaluate to two and this one did append because we are doing it against a string which is one thing when I do strings I don't know if I have a good example in here or not I might so like right here you can see I have a space between that but I don't have a space right there you know what it's easy for me to see but I know once the video renders it's supposed to be like this all the time. You can see I've got it on like this stuff like this, but for some reason Windows has a glitch in it and I have to switch to like another scheme every time I like reboot the computer and then switch back and then hit apply. And now I've got my proper cursors. So now you can see it a little better. Sorry about that. On my screen, the the uh, carrot or whatever it looks like good enough to see but yeah once the video renders I know it like is almost invisible so now you can see what I'm talking about a little better uh, what do we got here now I lost my train of thought of where I was at let's bounce back over here okay yeah the uh, that deal right there where I have no space because to me that kind of like signifies that the of course I'll a lot of people do that in cramped situations anyway if you're passing something as a parameter, right? So in my mind, I really could have got away with this, but whatever. This was, out of all the options, I just decided to roll with this. <laughs> Excuse me. And in general, I will do this. I'll pit that plus operator against the quote because for one thing, that saves a character, which sometimes is important, you know, especially if you're doing a lot of appending and stuff. Um, but it also kind of makes it, in my mind, become like that's the operator it's the string addition or the string appending operator instead of this floating out plus thing where it's not going to do a mathematical arithmetic operation it's going to do a string operation on it so anyway that's that let's go back over here and see what else anything worth talking about um so anyway we can see it's working and if i do control shift i or f12 to get into the console uh, console here then you can see apparently this is working this sentence replaces placeholder test of nested template little literal string it looks good so let's talk about those real quick um, so apparently this is working come over here to our better control Z on that till that asterisk goes away okay it'll be in the HTML file well let's apparently this is working might be in here something label something else this sentence replaces placeholder so that's the one we're seeing we'll talk about that one first this sentence replaces placeholder that was in file 2 placeholder so that worked we can come back over here we can go all the way down that javascript is not a big deal but this just happened to be where i was doing it i uh where's the console log or no, that console log was in that file. So now we'll go back to that first one. <laughs> Sorry, this is confusing, especially after it's been like an hour since I did it. So this deal right here is a console log in the browser itself. I was a little confused at when I even wrote this one, and I went in to find how back in that Node.js source file, like right here. But and I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I have, that's a browser one so this was a test to see like what if I wanted to use these back quotes in a string in JavaScript tags in the browser could I just escape it like this and get away with it so as you can see right here in the browser I defined how as quote unquote good and then I escaped this so that our back-end processor would treat it literally 
in the literal sense, if that makes any sense, and just not process it, but take it character for character and pass it on. So basically, it would just, you know, not process it and drop these slashes effectively. And then it would send it out to the browser, and then the browser would get it without the slashes, and then it would deal with the escape stream. So what we can see here is it looks good, so that means that it actually successfully did that and then we replace the function name so apparently this is working so right here that's not a valid function name on its own right in a javascript file so that means if we see apparently is working in the console then that means it properly called that that function i don't know if i added that to the html as well file js no that's about it oh yeah i did i so i called it i even called that function from of course that was replaced on the back end because it wasn't escaped and so it knew to call that it replaced the function name there as well with just function you know effectively just tearing off the uh, the dollar sign and the curlies okay so that's showing how this can be used you know that simply right there <laughs> all this talk was to basically tell you that you know ultimately what we're gonna do is even with just a single back quote and some of these sprinkled in some of these expressions or variables or you know you could even put a literal in there if you wanted to which wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense but yeah that's how simply this can be done with just javascript like pretty much native javascript you know like i mean besides it being native what is it like really i mean yeah i'm having to do some of this because of the web server or whatever but that's not technically boilerplate you know that's not capital b boilerplate because if you're not if you're just doing it for Node.js on some other back end then you wouldn't have to do that so uh, we come down here and literally I could okay now we're at the refactor phase let's refactor this down a little bit so we can get rid of this well let's look at this since we went to the trouble to go ahead and include that we can see yeah it passed in that back quote there and if we scroll down I think I ran it a couple times, so there's a couple extra pages or whatever. Function, no closing back quote, console log. Okay, so I think it's doing it with the JavaScript files too. And you can see if there is a back quote, this function I named no closing back quote, that's not an error because you can see there's no closing back quote. There's just that opening one. And right here was the JavaScript file one right before it, and it sent in both back quotes and everything. So anyway that's that's what that's doing so we can go ahead and get rid of that ideally in the real world I'd want to I I'm a freak and I would test that and make sure it works I need to start writing automated tests more often practice what I preach okay and then right here this file content to string deal I can extract that out well I'm not gonna do that just yet because we're using it in a couple places so right here let's get rid of all this stuff so what's going on here is if the first thing's that then check for the closing one and all that and then I talked about you know like let's go back here and look at this so I pit that's why I pit don't in brackets because initially it was like end the document with this right but then I said well don't because of like what I was talking about where you have to count it and all that but it took me a while of iterating to realize like yeah definitely don't do that so if we come down here to option B, that's that was the simplest thing I kind of went over, maybe with a couple bells and whistles. But um, option B was like, well, what if we do want to deal with nested expressions and stuff like that, like kind of like we started to do, but on a more intense basics, like somebody who's really doing a lot of this type of expression nesting and template literal strings and should they really have to escape every character themselves you know which is an option where we're at right now as i showed in the other thing in that html page is that somebody could do that they could come in here and uh they could do this you know they could still use those kind of strings as long as they escape the uh opening and closing you know any basically all of them any back quotes in the entire document need to be escaped and uh, any things that are basically a dollar sign curly 
zero or more text and a curly, those would need an escape in front of them too. But doing that, they could continue to use it and with the least implementation on the back end, but obviously more and more uh, workarounds on the front end, depending on how often you're using those strings or on a different layer in the back end or whatever you got going on. I'm going to go ahead and close this since we haven't used it in a minute. We're making some changes. That way we know we've got the full refresh and not dealing with some old state. Uh, so yeah, but it's like, oh man, that's kind of, that's a lot, you know, it's not too bad, especially for me, because I hate those strings, and I, the only reason I use them is for templating and macro expansion and stuff so far, so it doesn't bother me, I'm not going to have to escape them much, or if at all, probably, but I figure, you know, how universal is that, and could it be simpler, you know, all around, and it turns out, the answer is it could be simpler for me and people who use those strings a lot, so what we can do is go here and say, hey, new rule, you don't close the document with the, uh, no more of this. Let's get rid of this. So usually some people like to leave a new line at the end. That's understandable. That's fine. We'll even just do it to whatever. We already got rid of it over here. Our index.html, let's get rid of it. Save it. And, uh, so now we can do that. Well, okay, that's... We know our server already supports that, so I'm going to hit Shift F5, and boy, I got my little editor set up, and then I'm going to open a new incognito, or new private mode in Mozilla style browsers, and I'm going to go to localhost, and everything seems to be working. Go ahead and set the query string, hit F12, look at the console, all that seems to be good, no console errors, that's a good sign. Okay, so everything's still working, and then we go down here and go, okay, well, let's just always auto append this so if the file starts with that um, we're not going to check if the last character is that anymore that's a new rule is that the last character can't even be that and now we can even condense this statement up to one line I know some people don't like to do it but honestly in JavaScript uh, as long as you you can do an if state the bad thing is in JavaScript and probably a lot of other scripting languages, you don't want to do an if statement like that because there's a possibility that the auto uh, semicolon insertion will go through and do that and then file content will no longer apply to the conditional. It will just happen and your eyes will see that indent and be like, what's going on, what's going on? And you won't see that. <laughs> so that's the idea there. So if it can fit on one line and you could do this, you know, some people frown on it, but hey, the other option is to do a, uh, you know, basically come in here and go like that and then go or freaking I think I have to do a null there I don't remember uh, and then do that and that and that to me is just I don't know the ternary thing is just not that readable to me so anyway I just and I might have screwed up syntax-wise there, but, I mean, you have to do something to that effect. And I just look at it like, hey, this reads like plain English. If file content, if the first character, file content character zero, is exactly equal to a back quote, then append a back quote to the end of the file content. End of story. If it's not, then don't. And now it's no longer a compound statement, so we don't have to do the weird spacing that messes up my eyes. Because then I, if I, you know, had that whole deal where I've got some stuff, you know, and then that should be correct about that. So if I've got it like that more again, then I don't know. I have a tendency to jump and start looking at this as if this is like some almost arbitrary, like less valuable thing to care about. And then it's like, oh, well, technically this is after a compound statement, so I should do that at the very least, you know. And then do I want to do this? And now i got a bunch of extra space. So there's a lot of reasons I think of uh, design-wise of, like, getting rid of all that junk. And then now these are nice because this is one coherent little unit of stuff to where it's like, okay, the file content's getting put to that two string. And it looks like it has equal... Uh, priority equal equal weight in the scenario to me now or pretty close to it anyway and then we're you know we can tell this is a block of stuff that goes together 
and then maybe even in uh, where's my cursor so maybe even here I might even do something like that to kind of just let myself know give it a little bit more spacing and breathing room and also that this is sort of like this could be cut out into its own thing or whatever so and now I can do that and still fit everything comfortably within the screen you know because this is much more of an optional space this one kind of is too so we get here and it says uh you know file content to string of course away from that buffered array and then we're saying hey no matter what if this starts with that then append that because the rule is we can't do that and then go ahead and evaluate it and everything should work as the same I'll go ahead and test it real quick because just to show you know this really you should be testing everything after any little significant change like that ideally more automated testing right and then uh, go and have a look everything still appears to be working so we can do that and let's condense it down even one more we now that we're not doing those extra steps we can just do this in one hit and uh, come down here and paste that right there so we'll convert it to a string and then it will append that and otherwise we don't even need to convert it to a string the, that respond thing that we end up calling doesn't need it as a string you know so so look at that just to show you how much you really should be testing things at every little step this is what I pretty much do no matter what on my own anyway okay good thing I did it right because now we're seeing that what's going on here is something's not rendering right it's we can see what's getting sent to the browser still has that back quote there and that's not cool we that should be done away with so that's one of the reasons for freakishly testing every little step so let's kind of backtrack here of what's going on so the file content to string that must be happening second because I didn't see the appended one okay so file content to string then append that I gotta think about this for one second. So I guess the best way is to just not use the shorthand there. Or at least that's what I'm trying to do a screencast in a and debug stuff my half of my wits used up on producing the screencast and I can't look as cool as I want to but truth be told even when I'm not screencasting I sit there with my jaw drop staring at stuff for a long time anyway okay save that shift F5 on my setup and right click incognito mode and then I could even set up a shortcut in my deal I probably should by now to um automatically I don't even have to use selenium or whatever to get this so there we're seeing there's no back quote appended at the very bottom down here so that's saying that's not working and there's still that one up at the top which is causing it to render as I mean you could go in and force the mime type but that's not necessary I mean I can go back and test this through Netscape 2 and everything just in case you don't believe me on that, I'll do it right now. Shift F5. Here's Netscape 2.0. And we'll go to local host. I might have to pit in. Yeah, so. There it is in Netscape 2. And it's freaking out because of that right there. Of course. And that's throwing it off. But anyway, that was to show it tried to render it as an HTML page, but it had that stupid back quote there, so it can't actually, you know what I can do, Shift F5. Sorry it's taking forever, I'll just have to get this down better and uh, redo one maybe that's even shorter. But at least it's thorough, right? Oops. I want to do Netscape, and then we'll do local host, but I have another index file to .html that doesn't have anything. So this okay so it's getting pissed off because I'm asking the JavaScript engine to do that front-end um, back 
quote deal. We'll look at the source real quick. Where's that? Uh, view document source. So if we scroll all the way down here, this one right here is coming through. And I'm pretty sure that's the one it was getting screwed up on. Or maybe it was this label. Oh, this is console log. So it's probably like doesn't even know. It's probably erroring out in the console on that. But I think was it label? Maybe that. Or no, something came. Okay, everything came through. So it's probably just giving us the first one. Because Netscape, either way, even if this, even if this was um, processed and parsed properly, and it, you know, it would end up dropping these backslashes and sending the the regular literal through the browser. Netscape was way before that was introduced. And, you know, that's like this is literally JavaScript 1.0. It's not even ECMAScript 1.0. It's JS 1.0, which ECMAScript came like two years later. So that's how early of JavaScript this is. So besides those little things that it really doesn't know, it's doing a pretty good job at like part. It doesn't know get element by ID which there are ways around that that I think still work to this day of doing like um, calling the uh, the array style syntax on the document object. Okay, but it's doing a relatively good job. Of course, there's no styling because I've chosen CSS styling. When I very first did the page, I actually used center tags and stuff, which still works to this day in browsers. And then, you know, and then literally like hard coded, you know, I used the old school tags and it even looked formatted properly in everything in Netscape, which was really cool and then right here I have Firefox 1.0.8 which is Firefox 0 but the point 8 means of course some bug fixes and also I think that means that it was like Dom 2 or something like or maybe Dom 3 I don't know it it was like I think they caught the next version of Dom that was like 2005 era or something and then of course it's gonna render that one wrong but uh, index 2.html Bam, it renders that one properly. So, close all that out. So, what's going on here? We're appending file content to string plus that. Why is that not working? If that file content equals. Maybe it's not, maybe I'm, let's just try this. And I'll even do that, okay. What? Things are getting weird. If file content zero, the first character is that, then file content gets file content to string, which we haven't done. Okay, file content's not a string right here. So that's always going to go false. Durr. Okay, so maybe the best thing to do is to go ahead and, at least for now, until I think of something a little more clever, but readable. It's only cool to get clever if it's readable. Uh, file content dot and then we can just go back to the simple plus equals and take that up to this line right there and then get rid of that guy and then we can bring this one up one and that should work now. All right, back in business, test the query string. Yeah, that looks like it's working. Check the console. Console's all good. All right. So we're back in action and kind of threw me off from what I wanted my next step to be. So right now we're basically like that's it of course we need this state right here and a val is gonna pull in this local state one of the things don't believe 
a lot of the stuff you see about Avel is evil and all that. It's like, yeah, it can be, and so can every other thing, especially arrow functions, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, Avel has a place. It's It's got a reason. Even go to can be used in some languages effectively sometimes. It's just use it as a last resort, you know? Don't use it instead of something else always think like is there another way to do this and like even when i used a val right here it was like i tried to use the function constructor uh construct instead of a val and you know because it's like oh prefer that one it's faster it's safer da, da, da. and it's like you know what honestly a val is like this is if you leave a val in the language don't you dare take it out ts tc39 this is what it's for you know the original json was a vowel but of course they thought like oh there could be security issues with that especially with people using uh you know cross-site api type of stuff but if you're pulling your own back end and you know what's supposed to be there and everything then the security risks are pretty nil on all that kind of stuff you know so what i'm doing it for in a tight little thing like this a vowel is if you got a better idea let me know implement it test it first before we waste our time with it you know what i mean but how simple can you get right there so anyway on that note um this is it this is you know uh, like i said other than this setting the the state up for us this is the processor it's that freaking simple and then this is specific to our web server it's a little tack on that we needed to make sure we pulled in the right files and we're not pulling in binary files or or even other text files that we don't intend on processing so this is now effectively handling this let's test it one more time uh, I think we kind of already did but just to make sure test it with that index 2 file that for sure doesn't have let's open that up index 2 where are you at okay index 2 you can see there's no opening back quote and there's no closing back quote on it either so but it does have that still, which is funny. Okay. Let's go ahead, local host forward slash index two dot HTML. Ooh, it's not working. Let's go over here. What do we have? Web server running undefined doc type expected unexpected token on 3641 oh I wasn't gonna show that till the very end um, so we, it's a good thing we tested that 3641 that is file content so if the first one's that, then add that. Otherwise, don't. Okay, so it's still trying to eval the file content, which that would be extra processing anyway. So when it's getting that, it's not really a string like it should be. Because file content's coming into there. So when we slap that extra quote on the end of it and assign it to this, it's evaluating that stream right then and there it must be so that's a uh, easy fix like whatever just do something like that and come down here and do that that should fix it all up Index uh, two. All right, so now it's working. Let's check that console with uh, F12. We got an error, which I kind of expected. So let's look at what the first error is. Nothing. What did it say? Failed to load resource. The server responded with status 404 not found for second file JS because this one isn't. Uh, Let's go back over here, index two. We can see source second file JS. This one wasn't 
parsed so we should be getting that error because second file JS shouldn't exist like that um, let's go ahead and just hard code that one in there file 2.js and should be able to just get away with an F5 for now okay and uncaught token opening brace on index line 90 this is the one I was expecting I believe or actually I was expecting console log I think to be freaking out so that one obviously isn't gonna work that makes sense function name so we'll jump back over just go ahead and hard code it too and that's just it just ends up evaluating to that save that one hop over here hit control f5 control f5 will do a full more full refresh like the most full refresh that the browser is going to give you if you are using query strings then you'd want to come up here and highlight that and hit enter that way it gets rid of um or even post data or whatever so let's go over here unexpected token index 2 line 93 there we go that's the one i was expecting to be unexpected right there so that's cool okay well let's just keep working forward with this and we'll say hey you know so this has that's just more work anyway you know having to keep track of two documents if one does get parsed and one doesn't so let's save it like that jump back over hit f5 check the console bam everything's looking good it even replaced that one like it's supposed to without any back end parsing this is all um, this sentence replaces placeholder the reason this one worked and it did parse on the back end is because that's an external JavaScript file that's this file so it doesn't matter that we didn't parse index 2 because when the server when the browser said hey there's this file called file 2 here then it turned around in the behind the scenes and it did immediately asked our server our backend server for the file and when it did that file was parsed because it did have this quote and it did have to drop through this whole pachinko machine right here this same thing this was already invoked but it basically uh, it basically just came down through here just like that with that file too and uh, did that of course these variables got set for that one too so the way I'm doing it is if this was a massive website these variables would all be coded for you know if I had like a massive uh, site tree thing like folder tree of different HTML so this is obviously only going to work in the very simplest scenarios right there that would quickly need to be replaced with something more dynamic and flexible okay so everything's working like that let's go back now that we've kind of adjusted to work with that and test it against I'm going to close that out and do a fresh start on all this make sure we're current and because uh, sometimes I'll I'll do this and not realize I have like an old session going that I'm testing against. Okay, just do the regular old local host. We can even do, yeah, we'll just do that. Do the query string. It's all working. Check the console. And all that's working. Cool. So now we can come in here. I'm trying to wrap this up quickly and what needs to be refactored is there anything even worth refactoring right now really what i would do is i would just pull this out to a module right now what i was planning on doing was pulling this out to a module dropping these into a file an external file on the screencast and everything i'm just not going to do it because i anticipating that you know that probably take me 15 or 20 minutes maybe and then everything takes twice as long or longer for me to do it than i think it would take so that gets up half hour to an hour or something like and I don't want to take any more time but I think you get the gist here like if you see what's going on and you could imagine how that could refactor out even further that you know like I said this is the <laughs> that's the processing right there that is the processing and now we can have is there anything okay let's do this real quick now since that's the processing we don't have to escape any of this anymore that's a joke now should be I'm almost wondering how that worked 
That makes me scared. Um, labels still can't be escaped just for demonstration purposes. Jump back over the web server, fire it up, go in cog, do local. Ooh. So what's the problem? Test, so it's not liking that. Okay, I think that was a thing maybe I was going to refactor. So, if the file content is that, then add a closing one, then evaluate it. Hmm. I guess that I'm pretty sure JavaScript allows nested back quote strings. So there may be some more work there than I thought. I'll run that one more time. Shift F5. Hit F5. Let it error out again. So console log test of nested. It looks good out. So it was still working when I escaped it. I see in a regular string it shouldn't have to be escaped. I wouldn't think, anyway. It's, about, it's adding that, so it's taking file content and adding the closing string, which we know, that's why the other page was working. Then it is evaluating it, and that's where it's screwing up. Hmm. This was not something that I ran into, that I remember running into on my own. So that worked on the other one. So I guess for the time being, I'm not remembering. Maybe that's because I'd never refactored and tested it out fully, and I was just going on some assumption I had. I'm just not seeing this right now. So file contents already, that's the find up there. We're not doing like something with a global. Uh, file content to string. It's just, it's coming down to the way it's evaluating that. Okay, so what's going on is it's closing. We need another string on there. So to evaluate this, I believe we're supposed to pass eval a string, and what we're passing it, I guess, is a string wrapped in that. So, because I remember when I tested it manually at the console, I was doing like a single or a double quote followed by the internal quote. So I assumed that this would do that effectively. So maybe if we say eval and then give it a literal, that's kind of ugly, so I'll just do, um, I'll go ahead and do that, utilize that right here. And what I'm doing is I'm just doing a single quote, a double quote, and a single quote again. So I'm tacking on effectively uh, two double quotes, one in the beginning and one in the end. And let's see if this kind of solves the problem. And get rid of that console, get rid of this, and uh, start up a new instance of that and a new window here and now it's saying undefined invalid or unexpected token thirty-seven sixty-three oh I keep showing you that 3763 must be right there anyway 3746 37 63 hmm 
So for now it looks like if you use the back quote strings, they're going to have to be escaped. And I've just got to think if I really want to solve this problem because I don't even care about back quote strings, embedded, nested back quote strings personally. But anyway, the whole thing that we got here is uh, that we can do this templating with that single back quote and then we'll of course have to escape these for at least the time being until we figure out a better way to do this. And if I wanted to, I could get tricky and not escape that and then define how on the back end and then that should be replaced there. But, well, let's go ahead and do it since we've already... Well, first let's test it like this real quick. Save. Come over here, get rid of that one. Not working. Oh, yeah. Duh. Oh. Get rid of this junk. Get rid of that junk, fire up the server. I'm not even going to reload localhost, I'm just going to do it like that. Do the query string, hit F12. It looks good, so that's working now. And then I'm just even going to leave that up, close that out, and then we can go to that. It looks good. We'll get rid of that escape in front of that, and we'll come over here, and instead we'll define how right here. Fair how equals. save that, fire that server back up, come back over here, hit F5, and you can see very nice because it effectively replaced that on the back end. And then on the front end, what is that these days, like control U? On the front end, you can see it came through just like that. It wasn't, it didn't end up coming through like the label one that we left escaped. It, so by the time the browser got it, it never knew that there was ever a macro expansion to happen right there. And then since this is a modern browser, it's going to go, you know, it can handle those back quotes. So that is that. So there is the minimal file processor, I guess. And that's the simplest way to do some macro templates. Of course, don't forget you can do the expressions in there. The eval statement will give you access to this scope as well as the global scope if you have one or you know whatever and by that that means that inside of those macro expressions if you assign a value to something uh, I don't want to get too carried away here okay let's go to label since we know our escapings working there or actually I'll just go to something else here Let's add even one more, or no, got an idea. We'll set a variable and we'll call it some variable. We don't even know, this should be in the global scope since we're not adding the var keyword there. Some variable equals that. And honestly, I don't even know if it, that will, that should evaluate to some variable gets set to one plus one, which would be two. And then that variable just sitting there should expand to its value and end up replaced in there. But we'll see. Hop back over here. Shift F5. Okay, let me actually close that. That was right here. Label. Control U. Oh no, it wasn't. There it is. It, it did it evaluate to two. I just didn't notice it. So close that. Something two. So it evaluated the same thing, right? Duh. That's what. Sorry. That's what I was. Um, it effectively evaluated the same thing, but it assigned that value to a variable. So now there is a sum variable on the back end. There should be a sum variable like the equivalent of 
sum variable equals two going on here. So that's kind of scary. That that could get pretty hairy. So uh, what you can do instead of doing that is you can. Where are we now? How I had said earlier is the idea is attach everything to some object, some obj dot some variable like that. So even if that goes into the global namespace, at least it's all encapsulated in an object, right? Let's see if that just like that will work. Close this out and redo that. Oh. And then I'll go ahead and refire this up too. Wait, where's that on? Oh, I'm not on the web server. I'm on an HTML file. Okay. Uh-oh. Yeah, okay. That was kind of like a 50-50 trial and error. So some object wasn't defined. We need to roll an object. So if we come back over here and go to that index, let's see if we can just do that right here and say bear sum obj equals es3 syntax and then do that and have like a two statements embedded in there save that come back over here launch the web server again come here and just hit f5 and see if it works no it doesn't work because bear some object unexpected token bear okay so i kind of like that personally is that that's going to error out like that and not allow it to go down so if we come over here and now we have the choice of defining you know we could come up here and define it in the global scope or we can come here and just say bear sum obj equals an object if I did it right I might be going quick I might have used square brackets or something so double check my my work there for sure all right shift f5 but if it does error out like that, I'm just trying to finally wrap it up. Maybe I do Alt Space X to get that. Uh oh, it's not working even now. Varus. Oh, I didn't change the HTML. Um, come back over here. Index. Get rid of var. And then some objects already defined. I wonder. I'm pretty sure we can do two statements in there too. Let's see. Um, F5. Well, oh, that's taking too long. Oh, I didn't launch the web server again. Oh, we already have a window open. Let's try that. What's going on? No, it doesn't like that. Okay. No. Quit being tricky and just get rid of it. Okay, we'll do some object and then we'll just do something like that. Because we already know that's defined. And then got to launch it. Still not working. Some object missing. Yeah, so apparently you can't do that uh, compound of a statement, but I think you can. Now I'm just going over fundamentals that I really should already know before doing this. But I was like, hey. So that should work. Close this out. Okay, and check the console. That's working. And then last, it'll be little bitty test would be uh, see if we can run a function to let's go function um, where are we going to name it some func console dot log some func and then we'll call that So if we can effectively get some funk to run right here, 
then we know that we could do compound statements in the background even though we can only do one-off uh, statements right here or maybe I should say compound expressions because yeah, that's the thing is we're only supposed to do expressions and by me put I should have known that by me putting that semicolon in that effectively makes it a statement instead of an expression and so there's more to it so right here we're just going to try and call some funk and see we'll even uh we'll jump back over here and even make some funk return something uh, and go return some thing so this should run some funk log something to the console in the background and then it should return something for that exact spot we we're at. Okay, it returned something there. I went ahead and did the query string. It returned something there, so that's a good sign. Now let's check that console. Boom. There's everything. This sentence is a placeholder. I don't see that it actually. It did return something with all the spaces, that unique little something. So we know this ran console log some funk. Oh, it probably logged it to this console. Boom, some funk. It did. And the reason it's there twice is because I typed in that query string and hit enter. So it ran again. A little confusing. It's a good little last note to end it on is um, <laughs> using JavaScript on both ends. It's easy to forget if you're in the front end or back end. Sometimes, you're, or at least for me, my mind can get switched around. So that is that, and uh, right here, you know, obviously we're still stuck on having to escape them. At least we don't have to count them if we escape them. The other option is to put in a thing that counts them, but there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts about that of like, you know, you'd want to count um, all the possible conditions for whatever scenario context you're in of when a, a back quote might appear and then it comes down to the, I don't know, I just, that doesn't, it's totally viable, it's probably a lot easier than writing some other types of parsers and stuff, but I would just rather keep it simple, you know, and figure out if there's like some little trick I can do with like the eval or something like that, to where we can get it to where it will accept unescaped deals, so that's what I'm going to be messing with, and then of course, so now it is don't end definitely don't end with that I guess if you did do I'll leave that actually in there so the trade-off if you do make it so that you forcefully have to end with that quote then you can know that everything that's not the very last quote is in fact in effect the uh, it's a nested one that you should ignore and then you'd want to count the nested ones and if there's an odd count of the nested ones then you know you're inside of one and then therefore if you hit a dollar sign curly macro expander you'd want to escape that as well so that might be an option which I've alluded to right there And so that, that would, basically we're looking at, you would either have to make a mandatorily that you don't do the uh, the ending back quote or mandatory that you do, not the option of having one. I mean, you can do the option of having one, but obviously that would lead to more conditionals and uh, a lot more error prone because they're, I mean, there's the idea of like counting them and okay, if you're, at an odd count, unless you count the very first one too, then be if you're at an even count because you're ignoring the first one effectively, you know, then they're unclosed. But what if you're in a scenario where somebody might have, you know, that's assuming that they're going to always come in pairs and they might not, you know. Most, most anything I can think of offhand, I mean, those are so rare in most contexts and they usually do come in pairs. So you could get away with that to a heavy degree especially if you control the back and front end content like you're 
you probably could get away with that. And then option C is to just use your own pattern. Um, I've used something similar to, I think, how Vue does it right there as an example. And just do reg, reg X, regular expressions, to um, search and replace that stuff. And of course, that would be a little bit of an engine. I think there could be a simple, simple implementation that could work fairly well. But uh, the cool thing with the JavaScript template literal string style stuff is that it, you know, it's built into the language effectively. But if you want to go back and support ES3, then you would do something with regex, and you would, you could even do the back quotes too, and just use those as your markers. So, anyway, some stuff to think about. Thanks again for, um, for if you sat here and put up with us this whole time. And just one thing too, I might as well tell you, I was trying to just, so here's what I was going to leave this at, is I was thinking about naming it, um, like, you know how there's JSON, JSON, like J-S-O-N, JavaScript object notation. So I was on the fence with either like Jetlin for Java template literal notation or Jetson for J-T-S-N for uh, Java template string notation. And apparently template string was the old way to describe those type of strings. And I guess template literal is the new way. And so I was like JTLN or JTSN. And I like Jetson because it sounds like, you know, the Jetsons, the cartoon. Just like how Jason, Jason has a play on the name Jason sort of with it. But then I was thinking, well, what is it technically? Is it technically like a a literal um like is it a template literal technically or is it a template string like especially the context we're using it in so a template literal would mean that it's not really dynamic in my opinion it's a literal string so it's like but we're using it in a dynamic sense like we're wanting to replace we are using it as a template we're using the string as the template and then the uh, the macro expander is actually dynamic. It's not a literal itself. So I was like, well, that leans back towards the Jetson idea. But then the whole thing, the whole document's being dumped in initially as a template literal. I was like, uh, I was personally leaning towards Jetson for several of those reasons. Plus, it's the older way of saying it, and I like the older stuff. I like pre-ES6 and even pre-ES5. I basically lean focus most heavily towards ES3. Sometimes I'll even take a week or two and just do like, you know, JavaScript 1.0, like Netscape 2 style programming and stuff like that. I haven't done that in a while. I need to start taking notes whenever I bounce between stuff because I <laughs> I forget. I'll like literally spend so much time away from Python and stuff that sometimes when I go back, I'm like, wait a minute, do I need like semicolons at the end? Stuff like that. But one of these days I'm going to buckle down and make a quick ref sheet for all these languages and share it that will like so that it's much more efficient to jump between languages so my idea I my presentation that I had visualized was that when I closed it it was gonna you know everything was gonna go so harmoniously and then I could close it with this quote but in anything at all this was written by an engineer who engineered airplanes in anything at all, perfection is finally attained, not when there is no longer anything to add, but when there is no longer anything to take away. When a body has been stripped down to its nakedness. So the way I see this as relating to that is that obviously, you know, that single back quote and just using those macro expanders, you know, and being able to refactor to less code ideally. But of course, I obviously ran into some speed bumps there. Thanks a lot for listening to all of my babbling away.